Okay, uh, we'll begin after break. So we were looking at church history in the third century. And before that, uh, Akhil's question about uh, heresy. Basically, heresy specifically uh, refers to uh, when, you know, deviations or false teachings within the Christian uh, belief and truth. So, you know, um, and when those uh, teachings uh, contradict the uh, Christian faith or the Christian doctrines or the core Christian faith, the core Christian truths and doctrines and beliefs, then we call that as heresy. But the other religious books are not called as heresies, no. Yeah. And uh, when we are actually asking questions, uh, we need to be very careful, uh, not talking about any specific religious book or religion, because we are going on YouTube. And you know what can happen, right? So that is why I kind of, uh, OK. So, <laughs> OK. OK, so we were looking at the third century. In the third century, we saw that in 300 AD, North Africa became a key center for uh, Christianity. But then in 311, there was a great uh, you know, uh, division that was caused because of the Donatists. Uh, who said that you know all of these people who uh, you know who renounced their faith during the persecution under the Roman Empire, uh, Diocletian, you know and they came back to the church. The these uh, uh, Donatists were saying we should not accept them, we should not give them the leadership position. But the Catholic Church was saying no, we can take them back, and they were saying that you know. Um, uh, uh, administering, um, you know, the the sacraments uh, is not based on uh, the purity of the minister. It's that is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is going to cause the effectiveness of the sacraments, but it is, uh, you know, it is what Christ has done for us on the cross. Okay, but we see that this caused such a great division that for 300 years this was a problem in the church at North Africa. It caused such a great division that people eventually, you know, uh, Christianity, it weakened Christianity. And in the 7th century when the Muslim rulers came, you know, many of them, uh, uh, you know, accepted um, uh, that religion. Okay. So uh, we see that there was a great uh, rift here. And I was thinking, you know, 300 years and what did God do? So let me look at history. So it was, it's not mentioned here in your notes, but I just went and uh, in the publication, sorry, I, I, I read up and I saw that, you know, God had raised people like Territorian and, um, you know, Augustine. And Augustine, um, he basically strongly opposed the Donatist and he argued that the sacraments uh, were valid the, or the validity of the sacraments depended not on the moral character of the minister but on the Christ's grace. Okay, so that is what he said. He said, if these people have been like this but they've repented, they come back, it's okay, but it's uh, you know, administering the sacraments or uh, the sacraments, the validity of it does not depend on the uh, moral character of the ministers but on the grace of. Jesus Christ. Okay. And then he said that the church was a mix of both saints and sinners, and that only God could ultimately judge a person's heart. He also emphasized on the unity of the church as a body of Christ. And he spoke about how division can weaken the church, you know, and uh, the church's witness and the church's mission. So he spoke about that. And also he, you know, thought about, uh, you know, uh, church's understanding about the nature of sacraments and the importance of the unity in the body of Christ, so unity among believers. And then uh, also because of this division, the Council of Carthage was uh, called in 411. And during this time, the church, you know, um, um, Augustine, of course, called different bishops of the churches and the leaders of this Donatist. And, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, the church finally made a declaration that the Donatist sacraments were invalid. Okay. And um, also the Roman authorities sided along with the Catholic 
church. They took the Catholic Church's position, and they uh, the government got involved. The uh, the imperial government got involved. Emperor got involved, and he issued many ed edicts uh, saying uh, that people who support the Donatists they will be persecuted. They took away all the properties of this Donatist, and you know um, they really gave them a hard time. So the Donatists were even more angry than before because their property and thing was confiscated. They left the church and that caused a greater uh, divide. And there was such a great uh, problem that arose. And there was a lot of fighting that happened. And, uh, you know, this weakened the, uh, the church in Self. And finally, we see that when um, the Muslim invaders came, you know, um, um, the that region of Christians, you know, finally diminished altogether. There were not many Christians. And it's so sad, right? So what do you think about this? What do you think should have happened? This is something very significant, right? What are your thoughts on this? Can you please share? Come on. Think. 300 years. Christianity totally lost in a continent. But of course, God brought about revival. He's still doing things in Africa, but even then. What are your thoughts? Quickly. I mean to say that there was like no Christian activity. Like, in the there was, it was not growing. but it was not growing and spreading. Yeah. There was a lot of internal fighting. Right. Yes. Sister, revivals are not happening from 3rd century. There were uh, reformations that uh, began. Yes, there was a reformation that began. It was uh, and it led to a revival. We'll we'll look at that. But what do you think about this? This is something in important, this right? This also happens in our churches today, right? Yeah. In, in third the, and fourth century, it had a hold. I Means limited type, uh, limited revivals were there. Uh, not a revival, so to say. We can say there was some kind of reformation that happened. Yes. Okay. Okay. The people were not stirred within themselves like that. Sorry? People were not stirred to uh, stirred within the spirit to you know proclaim to but people were not stirred not in stirred. the spirit. I, I'm I'm specifically talking about this era 300, 311 that happened in, in North Africa. What are your thoughts on it? It can happen. Sir, I think the uh, the people depended on themselves, their own strength they were making decisions and not depending on the Holy Spirit. Yes, very true. And, uh, you know, just giving up a few little things, which is not something that they can hold on to, which cause a major division, right? Yes. Don't you think so? Just because some of them left the faith and they came back, we can't judge them, right? We can't say that they, they cannot be part of the church. Yes. Anything else? Don't you think this is a problem in our churches today as well? Huh? Being judgmental, divisions, holding on to one point and fighting for that. It happens within the Christian circle, within the churches. What do you think should we, we should do? What, was, what do you think was missing? Huh? Uh, love and fellowship. No fellowship. There's no leading of the Holy Spirit. Why was there no leading of the Holy Spirit? They're not obedient, okay? Huh? No unity, okay? What brings about all of these things? What brings about unity, oneness, fellowship? What brings it about? What brings unity and oneness? Love of God. The love of God, okay? And... And how does the love of God grow in our hearts? Huh? When you pray and you read the word, right? They were actually holding on to one thing and there was so much of discussion and fighting, but they were not coming together in prayer. But later on, when you see in the centuries that, uh, ahead, you see that people were so burdened about what was happening. They had, you know, they were they engaged in prayer and then we see how revival breaks out okay you know how powerful so we look at it okay so remember this incident that happened and so you know that hey when there's a problem in your church what should you do 
don't focus on the don't magnify the problem or that that what is causing division focus on the truth teach the truth and bring people together in unity and oneness and how through prayer and worship okay it can seem very simple but this is very very powerful and we look at how prayer was a major thing that finally led to revival okay so we'll move on any questions anyone has so far okay thank you lucy you said prayer deepu thank you love and the mm -hmm. word of god okay in ad 312 uh, the emperor constantine he was going to you know a, a battle and when he was uh, you know just before he went for the battle he, he sees a vision of a cross with the words in this sign conquer written under the cross and uh, he won the battle and when he won the battle he attributed that victory to the christian god he attributed the victory to christ and he became a supporter of christianity and the early church so what happened was during the uh, emperor constantine time uh, time the things changed for christians okay many of the lands that were conf confiscated that was taken away from them was given back to them he gave them properties he built huge cathedrals basilica so if you go to europe and in and parts of uh, england and all if you see those uh, big you know basilicas and uh, you know um uh, 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 places of uh, worship, you know, cathedrals, all was built during, most of them was built during this uh, era, this time, okay? So he built many churches, he gave the Christians land, and so people began converting to Christianity in millions. Millions of people started converting into Christianity. Why? Not because they convicted of their sins, but because it was a very convenient thing for them to do. It was not a conversion of the heart it was a conversion of the just of the you know uh, property or you know prosperity that they were going to get or the benefits that they were going to get okay so there was no heart conversion there was just you know for convenience sake and because of mass people like millions coming into the church converting into christianity they brought into that many pagan into the church many pagan practices okay and because their conversion was not genuine things were really getting out of hand in the church okay and so we see that 8313 to 8337 emperor constantine's reign brings favor to the early churches and during this time in 318 arose the arian controversy okay very important uh, another wrong teaching uh, arianism that was against the divinity of Jesus Christ and his relationship with God the Father. So Arian brought about a lot of false teaching or wrong teaching about the deity of Jesus Christ and the relationship between God and the and fa the Father. And so the church tried to correct him, but he refused to back out or back down. So they excommunicated him from the church. But his teaching had done such a widespread, uh, you know, uh, uh, damage. And so Constantine decided to call a the, uh, council of bishops of all the leaders, the churches, the bishops in, in Nicaea. And Nicaea is in modern day Turkey, okay, to resolve the dispute. And they came out with the Nicene Creed. You know the Nicene Creed? Many of you in the churches, you read the Nicene Creed, but I don't think you know it's the Nicene Creed. Okay, we say, um, uh, I believe in, in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ. Okay, so they brought about a creed, which formulated the core beliefs, and the truth or the doctrinal truths of the church. Okay, but we see that this um, uh, uh, Arian controversy was not fully uh, resolved till another council met the council of constantinople in ad 381 okay another important thing about this council of nicaea which is another council that happened before this the council of jamnia right where they brought about uh which are the books in the old testament you know, um, which is canonical or recognized as Holy Scripture. And before the Council of Jamnia, which was the other council? The council that happened in 
Jerusalem. Remember Paul and Barnabas? They go from and the church in Antioch in Syria, Acts chapter 15, I think. You know, they go there and um, they, um, they, yeah, Acts chapter 15, and, you know, it's decided that the Gentiles don't have to follow Jewish customs and rituals and especially the circumcision. So this is another uh, council uh, that happens here, okay, Council of Nicaea. And even in this council, uh, they uh, officially approve the patriarchs. And who are the patriarchs? The bishops of Alexandria, Rome, and Antioch, who are given, uh, you know, authority over larger provinces. And then eventually they will become the bishop of Rome, uh, who would become the pope. So how did popes come up? It was through these bishops who were bishops of different churches of Alexandria, Antioch, and Rome. And they were given um, the authority over larger provinces. And finally, one of them would be selected as a pope, uh, as a as the Bishop of Rome, and he would be called as the Pope. So that's how the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church uh, came about. Okay. Now, in AD 367, the canon of the New Testament was confirmed. That means they confirmed, hey, these are the books that are supposed to be part of the Holy Scriptures of the New Testament, which is authoritative and inspired by the Holy Spirit. In, uh, in 384, the Latin Vulgate, Vulgate basically means common or popular, okay? A uh, Bible was composed. So the first Bible composed in uh, 384 in Latin, and that was by Jerome. So what he did was he studied uh, the, the Old Testament was written in which language? The books in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek, so he took the original Hebrew and Greek text, and he translated that into Latin, okay? And um, so the Latin, Latin Bible was there. And then uh, we move on to the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. And even during these Dark Ages, you know, when there's a lot of uh, problems in the church, we see that in spite of that, there was a reformation that started. Okay, so uh, in AD 500 to AD uh, 1500, the church became an institutionalized church. The church was institutionalized. Okay, why was it institutionalized? Because the emperor, those, or you know, the the government or the emperor dictated things. What has to happen in the church? Okay, that was a big downfall. That led to many, uh, you know things that happened in the church, and that is why it's called as the Dark Ages, okay? So in the church, as it is, there were many pagans coming into the church, you know, uh, not because they were converted in their heart, but because of the comforts they were getting as Christians. So they came into the church, and they brought in many pagan cultures, and so we see that the steep decline of moral and spiritual condition in the church. And so form, liturgy, and rituals replace the scripture. So there's no longer scripture reading and, you know, uh, you know, preaching from the scripture like we have in our churches today, but there's a lot of liturgy and form and rituals. And so that replaced the scripture and the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? And we see that the laity, that means the common people, did not have access to scripture. Okay, why? Because they read the scripture, they will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. And they will know that the church is, uh, you know, what are the politics happening in the church, the wrong things happening in the church. So, you know, uh, 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 they were not allowed to read the scripture. And also the priests were not reading the scripture. Okay, so they were not following because they were very happy. They were the, the government was supporting the church. They were getting nice money and everything. So there was a lot of moral degradation in the church. They were lost into immorality and a lot of sinful activities because, and hence they were not reading the word. So things declined even more. There were wrong practices like prayer to the saints. They started praying to the saints. There was belief in purgatory. You know what is purgatory? Purgatory basically means, you know, uh, purification of souls. Souls that are died, okay, dead and gone, they try to do some purification for them uh, so that, you know, the, uh, uh, the effects of sin does not stop them from fully entering the presence of God. So, huh? all these are false things that were happening, yes. 
<laughs> yes, kind of. Yes. So purgatory. Then there was trans substation, uh, substantiation. Okay. So what is that? When they said that you know the grape juice and the wafer, the communion elements were really we were drinking the blood and the, eating the body of Jesus Christ. Okay. So all of these wrong teachings that were there, and indulgences were there. What are indulgences? Basically, you know, you do a sin, you pay money, and you can, you know, overcome that sin. You know, uh, pay money to legalize sin. Okay. So that was indulgences. And also that many relics were worshipped. That means relics means the physical remains of these uh, saints, you know, or the objects that were associated with the saints and martyrs and the holy figures, you know, they were venerated and they were respected in, uh, like, you know, it happens even now today in Christian traditions, okay? So um, all of these wrong teachings and wrong practices and rituals happening in the church and you know, the the uh, uh, the bishops and all announce that the church is infallible. That means what? What is the meaning of infallible? The church is without any fault, okay? Uh, and it is, uh, you know, it is safe proof. It is, uh, it, it's, it's unfailing. Uh, so they say, trying to say, hey, you can't blame us. You can't point a finger at us because the church is infallible. And, you know, and the powers were with the pope who was the bishop okay the main head bishop and we see at this time monasticism also started to decline remember monasticism yes no what is monasticism what is monasticism which era was monasticism 380 yes Rise of monasticism, monks, remember, who were spending time in fasting, prayer. They preserved the scriptures, they pre preserved the doctrines. Yes. And also, they did mighty signs, miracles, and wonders, the supernatural. They were called as church fathers and desert fathers. You forgot? We just learned it half an hour back. Okay. So, monasticism began to decline, and it was losing much of its spiritual focus. Uh, power and vitality, that means power also maybe the supernatural was not happening. So in this dark ages, if you would have told anyone, hey, there's a time coming when people will worship God in spirit and truth, it will be completely foreign for them because nothing like that was happening in the church. And during these dark ages, if you told people that, hey, one day all of us will have the Bibles in our hands, you know what would be their response? No way, it's impossible. Okay. And if you told people in these dark ages that, you know, there will be a time when every believer will be a minister of Christ Jesus, they were like, forget it, you know, but look what the Lord has done. Amen. Okay. Look at where the church is from where it was, you know, in the dark ages. Okay, out of the darkness that crippled the church, God has raised up a mighty and a powerful church. A church that is mighty, powerful, he's raised up an army, he's still raising up an army, and nothing is impossible with God. Amen? Okay, so why was uh, it called as a dark ages? Why was it called as dark ages? Why was it called as dark ages? No fellowship, no prayers, no, no worship, no prayer. Yes, no, no reading of the scripture. No supernatural works or the works of the Holy Spirit. Yes, all was replaced by what? The 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 emperor and the pope, you know, taking supremacy and dictating things and all of these rituals. Okay, like um, uh, you know, liturgy was more important, purgatory, uh, transubstantiation, transubstantiation, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and also different indulgences that people were. So that you can pay money and legalize sin. So people would just sin and come and pay money, right? So the church was becoming very, very wealthy, okay? 
but it was very sad and also we see that relics relics of uh, you know physical remains or objects of these saints were also venerated and uh, worshipped and monasticism also declined at this time so all of these things were happening but even during this time when there was all of this happening there were some positive things that also happened okay so in ad 596 we see that Mon Mo monk gregory sends augustine and a team of missionaries to england and within a year they are able to uh, you know uh, uh, get 10000 people baptized amazing right so even in the dark ages god was raising up people he was doing the work of reformation and also there was a move of the supernatural and um, you know revival that was breaking out we see that in ad 635 the fir first christian missionaries arrive in china okay um, first christian missionaries from asia minor and persia arrive in china and by this time missionaries carried the gospel to several parts of the world and there was also a stirring of reformation so who is the father of reformation martin luther but before martin luther we look at what are the other people who build up to where martin luther came and bring brought about the reformation okay so in uh, uh, 1150 to um, uh, 1270 there was a man called peter waldo he was a very wealthy, rich businessman in France. And he read the scriptures. And he, you know, just wanted to follow what God had instructed in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 13. And he decided to go about preaching that, you know, giving up all his material comforts and everything. Just imagine, rich man just taking the word, going out and preaching. And soon people started following him and doing what the scripture said in Matthew chapter 10. And they rejected the teaching of the institutionalized church. Okay, What the church as an institution had you know, brought about all of those teachings, they rejected it because they knew that was not what scripture was teaching them. They started following what scriptures was teaching and thus thus began began the reformation in a small way so we see that uh, peter waldo basically urged the church to return to the pure teaching of scripture to reject this purgatory and uh, you know that the church was infallible to reject that to reject all of those rituals and everything that they were following and also to accept that you know uh, the lay people Ordinary people, it's not just the priests who could preach, but also the lay people who could uh, preach. Okay, And uh, selling one's goods and giving to the poor were acts of consecration. Okay, And uh, in uh, 1266, you know, um, we see that the Mongol leader Khan um, sends a request to the Pope and asks him to send 100 Christian missionaries, but very sadly, only two responded. And out of that two, only one person died before they reached the Mongol territory. So you see that even when the leaders, you know, were looking for missionaries, there was no one willing to go. Okay. So it should not be said of our churches today. We need to raise up our churches, each one of them in our churches, in our congregation, to know that every believer is a minister of god and each one are called to fulfill the great commission to go out as missionaries okay in um, 1200 the B the bible was now available in uh, 22 different languages okay isn't that wonderful yes okay mm. and um, we see that uh, in um, in 13 uh, 82, okay, um, John Wycliffe was known as the Reformation Morning Star. So before even Martin Luther, we see John Wycliffe and we also see, um, you know, um, 
what's his name, Peter Waldo, who also brought about a Reformation. So it's Peter Waldo and John Wycliffe, okay? So John Wycliffe was known as a Reformation morning star, okay? He was somebody who was educated at Oxford University. He received his doctorate in theology, and uh, he lived almost 200 years before the Reformation, but he is called as a Reformation morning star. Why? Because he declared or he believed and he declared that it's the right of every Christian to know the Bible and that the Bible emphasized that the need of every Christian to see the importance of salvation in Christ the Loan. So salvation is not in keeping some rituals, worshiping some relics, you know, doing some uh, purgatory or in, uh, you know, in doing all of those things, okay, but in, in worshiping the saints, but it is only through Christ, only through Christ we can receive salvation. He said that is what the scriptures teach us, and he emphasized on that. And he also emphasized the right of every Christian to know the Bible. And he said every Christian, you know, uh, can receive salvation not through pilgrimages or, you know, uh, works that they have to do or paying money for uh, to legalize their sin or attending church services like the masses that they used to attend. No, uh, it is through reading God's word, obeying God's word and salvation is through Christ alone. So Wycliffe translated in, uh, in 1378, he, uh, he translated the Bible into English uh, using, he used Jerome's Latin Vulgate as a basis for his translation. And his translation work was completed in 1382. Uh, okay. And, um, uh, but after that, he uh, died. Okay. But we see that, uh, you know, he had, uh, he translated uh, the Bible uh, into um, English. Okay. And in 1415, um, John Huss was from Czechoslovakia, and he uh, also studied theology. Um, he got a master's degree from the Charles University in uh, Prague, and also he became a professor later on in that same university in Prague, in Charles University, and he was also a preacher in the Bethlehem Chapel, and uh, he was inspired by the writings and the teachings of John Wycliffe, and he also believed that the church was not supreme, neither was the Pope supreme, and he felt that there was a lot of reformation or uh, remodification or reforms that need to be taken up in the churches to eradicate all of the corruption, to eradicate all of the things that were uh, uh, going on that was wrong in the abuse of the Roman Catholic Church. And us also, John Huss also believed that each person should have their own Bible in their own language that they could read. And an important thing about John Huss is he preached uh, justification by faith. He said we are justified not by our works, not by paying money to legalize our sin, not by doing some works of charity, not by attending masses or just worshiping those saints and relics, but he said we are justified by grace through faith. Okay. So, and he also spoke and preached about the supremacy or the authority of the Holy Scripture. And look what happened to him. He was excommunicated by the Pope from the church, and he was handed over to the secular authorities, and they burned him at the stakes. Okay, Burn him at the stakes means like, you know, on a pole, they put him, and they just burned him up. Okay, so what we, you and I take for granted today that salvation is by, we are saved by grace through faith. We take it so easily, lightly, okay, and some of us, you know, um, churches have come up, greater grace. What is greater grace? You can keep on sinning because there's a greater grace of God, how sad that is, you know, and how lightly we take the grace of God, but when people have paid you know, with their very lives paid a big cost for to live for this truth and to preach this truth that salvation or, you know, um, we are saved by grace through faith. So let's not take it lightly, right? Let's not take sin lightly. Let's not take the grace of God lightly. Are you all listening? Yes? Okay. So we'll move on in... Um, 
1455, we see that Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press and was the first person in history to print books. And so in 1455, we have the um, uh, Gutenberg uh, Bibles that was published. And he printed a big stock of Bibles because, you know, it was sorry, available in the Latin language to the church. So he printed that and, uh, you know, gave it to the uh, church. Okay. And then we see uh, a reformation that begins in AD 1501 to 1800. Okay. Uh, reformation, which is leading to revival. Okay. So in 1516, we see Erasmus, uh, a Dutch scholar uh, who was a monk. He turned into a writer. And he was someone, you know, who actually uh, started in, 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 a, in, you know, in a sense that he was the one who brought about two things, you know, that helped to strike and bring about the Reformation. Okay. So what are the two things? He first brought out a satire. What is a satire? A satire is broccoli, uh, basically mockery and sarcasm. So he, he wrote a poem, uh, you know, like a satire that was mockery. Uh, uh, and he used humor in talking about the corruptions and the shortcomings in the church. Okay. And, um, uh, and also he, what he did was, you know, he translated uh, the Bible again because he found that there were a lot of errors in Jerome's translation. Jerome translated the Bible into Latin, right, from the Greek, the Hebrew, and the original Hebrew and Greek text. But we see that uh, 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 Erasmus, he went on to reconstruct, okay, looked at the original Hebrew and Greek, uh, looked at where, uh, you know, a lot of discrepancies were there, a lot of mistakes were there. He um, he translated that, he did a good job, and he provided a new Latin translation of the uh, Bible. And he also added a thousand notes that pointed out the common errors in interpreting the Bible. And he attacked the Roman, uh, uh, you know, priests uh, who refused to, you know, um, change their ways because he attacked them by saying that, hey, you priests, you know, you are um, saying that you should not marry, but you yourself are living with mistresses, you know. And uh, he denied that the popes had all the rights that they claimed. He also uh, challenged the practices in the church that were not found in the scriptures, uh, like the prayers the say to the saints, the indulgences, the re relic worship. All of these things he uh, pointed out. He said, hey, these are not in the Bible. And also he, you know, kind of uh, spoke against these priests who are living immoral lifestyles and also the wrong teaching and the practices in the uh, church. Okay. And um, uh, we see that, you know, in, in uh, 1516, February 1st, Erasmus released his New Testament and he dedicated to Pope Leo uh, the Ten. Okay. Uh, and um, so that is another... Um, uh, Bible that comes out, Latin Bible that comes out um, with less errors and less mistakes. And um, then in 1517, Martin Luther, uh, who was greatly, um, you know, um, uh, uh, influenced by, um, you know, these people like um, Erasmus, and also he was influenced by um, um, uh, John Huss, and all of these people, and uh, you know, he posted the 95 thesis on the uh, door of the church in Germany. Okay, posted it on October 31st, 1517. So, what are these 95 theses? Basically, 95 errors that he pointed out uh, against the church, and it helped many of them who read it to step out of the church and to believe in the teachings of the scriptures. So that is how Reformation started. So you see how these people, you know, they stood up for the truth, they spoke the truth, in, even though they knew that they are going to be persecuted or they will be martyred and uh, killed. And after that, we see that many reformers rising up. 
okay so before we move ahead anyone has any questions doubts anything you like to ask anything ma'am is, yes. is there still gutenberg bible exist or the gutenberg bible maybe is there in some uh, you know um uh, it was all actually uh, translated and revised and so we have the latest revision we look at it king james version and all of that came out of all of these uh, you know works that were done uh, the translations that were made and finally we have the uh, king james version the, and the revised king james version yes yeah so maybe it might the gutenberg bible might be in some uh, museum or something as you know something that is uh, said how different it could be uh, like it's called gutenberg bible because the the translation of the latin bible was just printed printed by him because he was the first person who invented the printing press and printed material so that's why it's called the gutenberg bible doesn't mean that it's it is his own writing of uh, or understanding about god the holy spirit inspired him to write no because we know that the canon were already formulated the scriptures which were considered as holy scriptures were already decided and finalized so nothing was added after that so those scriptures which the canon had accept was uh, was canonized that was translated into latin and to english and to other languages uh, uh, and which was you know the translations were revised yes but uh, this catholics have they have some more Sorry? book roman catholics yes they have some more books uh, in their bible yes they so, have more books that they have uh, so is that they have added or they had just they have uh, added for themselves yes catholic church has added some books written by some of the saints and apostles because they believe a lot in saints and apostles right so it's not uh, according to canon right that is not what is the uh, uh, recognized by uh, you know uh, the christian church yes the protestant church as the uh, holy scriptures yeah sister what is liturgy 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 is like um, you know um huh? yeah plan for the service what you will pray okay. what you will say you know all of that so every okay. if you look at you go to csi right uh, lucy yes, yes sister but the liturgy what is mentioned during this period did they have any false set of rules do they have any here uh, in uh, 500 ad yes uh, the um, what is that within the church there was a st steep decline of its moral and spiritual condition form mm -hmm. liturgy form liturgy and rituals replaced scripture yes so yes. the liturgy is, is basically you know a prayer um, uh, you know the rituals readings hymns and other okay. acts of uh, worship you know that happens in in the churches okay so we see that you know uh, different denominations like the catholic the orthodox uh, the anglicans they have their own specific uh, liturgies of course there are common elements like prayer and scripture reading and sacraments and all that but many of them uh, in in when we what you are referring to it was not based on scripture but you know it was just based on what the pope felt or the you know the emperor felt and what uh, you know the other leaders felt had to uh, go down in the liturgy so the liturgies were basically to saints uh, and to relic worship and also like i said right a purgatory uh, purification of uh, saints who were people who were dead um, and also trans some substantiation that you know uh, thinking about uh, the blood and the wafer of uh, jesus as the, uh, the blood and the body of jesus christ so all of these things were the false teachings and all of this part was part of the liturgy so since all of this was not in scripture then we know they could not use scripture to back these uh, uh, things that they were using in their liturgy okay okay sister did that sister, help yes sister it helped me and what about the denominations how did it start off with sister christian denominations 
how did the Christian denominations uh, begin? Uh, we look at that, uh, but basically it was because of liturgies, you know, okay. and uh, doctrinal uh, differences uh, that uh, people had uh, based on the doctrinal differences and um, you know uh, uh, the, the the liturgies that came up you know uh, uh, different denominations came up because of that but basically different denominations was because of different doctrinal uh, beliefs and uh, what they agreed to yes oh, okay okay sister thank you sister thank you lucy yes so uh, many reformers they stand and they were against the, the, that uh, people were doing wrong so they were against them yes. that priest and all they were yes. against them so they were led by holy spirit or they thought in their mind that this is wrong so we should stand against them what do you think holy spirit and also god uses our mental faculties if God, only the Holy Spirit and none of us have to come to Bible college, none of us have to read the Bible, none of us have to, you know, meditate on God's word. Why? Because when we have a problem, the Holy Spirit will speak to us. But how does the Holy Spirit speak? Through the word of God and uh, through prophecies, through counsel of other people, uh, through visions and dreams. But what did we learn? All of these things has to be validated with the word of God to scripture. Okay. So, yes, the Holy Spirit also enables them, gives, tells them what they need to speak, write, and all of those things. But also it is because you see all of these great reformers, they were highly edu educated people, Harvard, Hale, you know, they, they learn under Irenaeus, uh, Polycarp, you know, all of them learn under Apostle John. So they received from him. And how were they able to defend their faith? Because of their learning. And Erasmus, you know, um, um, and um, John Husk, um, you know, he was also got a master's degree in the Charles University in Prague. And we see even um, 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 Erasmus was a very learned man. Uh, Martin Luther also. So all of these people, you know, they were educated in the word of God in theology. And so God used their, you know, learnings and their intellect, their minds, and also, you know, um, the Holy Spirit. So if they had to defend the scriptures, they had to know the scriptures well. That is why these people like Erasmus and uh, John Wycliffe and all, they read the scriptures. They said, hey, when we read the scriptures, the scriptures are teaching us, what if every, uh, the laity didn't have, uh, you know, scriptures, right? The, the priests in the, in the dark ages, they, they did not allow the laity to read scriptures. Why? Because the script, they read the scriptures, they will know what is wrong happening in the church. So, but these people said, no, if, Scripture is made available, and that is why Erasmus and, you know, um, uh, uh, yeah, John Wycliffe, all of them go on to uh, 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 interpret the uh, Bible and write it out so that people can have it in their own languages. Yeah, good question. Anyone else? Was this one more minute and we'll stop here. So I hope you learned some things today. Uh, you picked up some things, uh, even as we looked at uh, history, and it's just so powerful how God is moving, that even in the dark ages, that God started a reformation, right? And there was a move of God, and many people rose up, right? Any questions from the online students, except, other than Lucy? Uh, the can you sell that question in the mic please so that are the time gap between uh, Malachi, Malachi and, and Matthew, Matthew? There was a lot of silence, no? four hundred years. Or something. Yes, so yes. Is that also the silent archaic? period. Yes. The, that... Why was it called silent period? That time there was no revelation. Uh, revelation there was uh, no move of God. There was no you know um, visitations. Yes, there was nothing. So it was called silent period. Yeah. But God did not speak and move. <laughs> yeah. There was no fresh revelation, no move of God's silent period. Yes.
And that, that time it was all this Maccabean revolt and all of that things that happened. The Maccabees, the Maccabean revolt that happened, all of that. Oh, nothing is, yes, it's not right. So some of these uh, uh, these uh, books and all those in the intertestamental period time was is also what is added in the Catholic Bible. Yeah, many literature was written during that time. Yes, so it is not uh, like the apocryphal books or something. Like that's not uh, added. Can you use your mic, please? Worldwide, who is more in population, Catholics or Protestants? If... Worldwide, who is more into... Catholics or Protestants, I think it is the Catholics, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Catholics are more than the Protestants, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for joining class. Thank you for your patience in listening. And I hope it helped. God bless you all. Take care.